Good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Sloma. Welcome to the New York State Archives webinar, Managing Oversized Maps, Plans, and Drawings. Today's presenter is Dennis Riley. Dennis is the New York State Archives Regional Advisory Officer for our Hudson Valley Catskill region. This region consists of 11 counties from Rockland and Westchester all the way up to Otsego and across to Columbia. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Please type any questions that you have in the chat box and we will take them at the end of the presentation. And at this point in time, I will change Dennis's role to presenter and he can take it away. Uh, thank you, Rich, for that introduction and let me add my welcome to everyone for joining today's webinar. As the title implies, I will discuss some of the challenges we face when trying to manage a variety of oversized materials such as maps, plans, and architectural or engineering drawings. To put it in some perspective, one of the key plot lines in the Star Wars movie franchise is this issue of managing records, accessing archives, and using maps and plans as the key to success. And if you think back, bear with me, or stick with me, the original 1977 film, the central element was control and access to the plans of the Death Star. So even an issue the Galactic Empire struggled with. But you don't need to be a Jedi master in order to master some basic common sense approaches to managing these types of records. So the objectives today are pretty straightforward. I'm gonna start by highlighting why these records are important in the first place. Why should we care about them? And then I will spend about the first half discussing key elements of maps and drawings, some common characteristics such as format, media, the different production processes, and how these affect how we can manage them. And then in the second half, we'll explore some records management basics, but through the lens of oversized materials. And this includes assessing the challenges and coming up with strategies on how to get physical and intellectual control over them. So there's a lot to unpack here, but as Rich noted, I encourage you to use the chat feature to ask any questions or raise any issues, and hopefully I can address those before we wrap up today. So why are they important? Well, I think um, an important function of government is to regulate and manage construction projects as well as land ownership, whether this involves private property or public facilities. These records document real property ownership, rights of way and easements, and the physical integrity of structures. Building and engineering plans are important to public safety, such as part of code enforcement, or just simple regular maintenance and upkeep of public buildings and infrastructure. And they guide the development of vibrant communities, such as through planning and zoning. As a result, property-related records in my opinion, are among the most valuable records maintained by government. These records not only provide essential evidence of legal rights, but they can also be critical in terms of emergency and disaster response, such as subsurface plans when a water main breaks. So not maintaining these types of records can lead to legal as well as other costs and risks. And I would just share one example to highlight this. Uh, in Pennsylvania back in 2002, the Quick Creek mine accident was caused because of the use of outdated maps, which led to a mining disaster that threatened the lives of nine miners. They were trapped underground, rising water levels were starting to endanger their lives, but because of timely access to maps in government archives, nine men were able to go home to their families. Now, this may be a dramatic example, uh, but it illustrates the importance of good records management when it comes to these types of records. I think it is important to always remember that government records affect real people and real lives. So I'm now gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about some common characteristics and how they impact uh, records management or considerations we need to factor in. And it may be so, somewhat self-evident, but maps and plans are different from most textual records. First and foremost, they are pictorial rather than textual, so they're graphically oriented 
and the image is as important as any text. Unlike other records, which we manage at the series level, maps and plans often need to be managed at the project level or the property level, such as section block and lot. Sometimes, depending on your business needs, we might need to manage them at the item level, which can be fairly cumbersome. In other instances, maps and drawings will be managed as a series unto themselves. Normally, we don't approach records management based on format, but rather by content or function of the records. But circumstances may be such that managing oversized materials as a series makes sense. And I keep using this adjective oversized. So again, obviously, size is a factor. Standard architectural and engineering drawings can range from letter size eight and a half by 11 inches up to three by four feet. Although in my experience, particularly older ones can be much larger. And with modern large construction projects, such as a commercial building or a housing development or a bridge, uh, the sheer volume of drawings for a single project can be significant. So the size of the materials and the volume complicates storage use and preservation. Again, these may be self-evident, but the records also rely on precise measurement. So re reformatting them can present challenges to make sure the correct scale is maintained. And for older drawings, how they were produced, their media and format is an important consideration. It can also be challenging when managing electronic versions because of proprietary format and other issues related to electronic records. And we will talk about these considerations in more detail throughout the presentation. Just for reference, these are, uh, if you're not familiar, the standard architectural and engineering sizes for drawings in the United States. Sometimes the sheet size will be referred to by the corresponding letter. And as I mentioned, older drawings before the standards were introduced may be larger. That's really just there for your future reference. Further complicating all of this is that maps, plans, and drawings do not exist in a vacuum. They are often just one type of documentation related to a specific project, such as these listed here, specifications, work orders, permits, etc. To a large extent, these records support and depend on each other, and so together they constitute the whole records landscape when dealing with land use and property regulation. As a result, they need to be managed together and not in isolation. So often, these oversized materials are stored together in a construction project file or a real property file. They're kind of folded and jammed into folders and boxes. But because of their unique physical characteristics, sometimes they'll be stored separately. If that's the case, you then need to sort of maintain that connectedness, that those, those linkages with the associated records to ensure efficient and effective access. And just to put this in a little bit of historic per perspective, the image on the bottom here is a Dutch colonial building permit. So again, land use and regulation and management of these records has been around for quite some time. So now I'd like to discuss some of the more common types of hard copy media that you're likely to encounter. Not everything is digital, not yet at least. Um, and these drawings will generally date from before the 1990s, after which you will likely be dealing with computer generated designs produced on modern paper with toner ink, much like what we have for textual materials. But prior to the widespread use of computers and large format printers, Maps and drawings were created using a variety of materials and processes that evolved over time. And the challenges we face will depend on these processes. It will depend on the age of the materials and the nature of the materials. So I think it's important to understand these production processes since how they were created will impact how they should be managed, stored, and preserved. And there are two basic elements to consider, the carrier or the base material on which the drawing is made, which is sort of represented by the list on the left. So whether it's paper or mylar or some sort of linen, 
where it's in a bound volume like a map book. And then there's the media or the process of how the image is applied or created, which is the list on the right. So are we dealing with some form of ink or pencil? Is the process a blueprint process or some other process? And if there are colors, is it like crayon or watercolor or marker or some other type of, of media that created the image? And just some specific examples of how these impact the records. Uh, if you think of iron gall ink, which was the dominant ink formulation up through the 19th century, it can be so acidic that it will eat through the parchment or paper. Whereas so-called modern inks of the 20th century might be susceptible to fading or might not be light fast. I'm thinking of like markers and that sort of thing. So I think it's fair to say though contemporary printers are much better. We see less preservation issues, but it also depends on the carrier or the production process. So the images may be susceptible to peeling or transfer if the base layer is some form of plastic or polymer, or if the paper is, is cheap and acidic, you're going to face embrittlement issues. Any map or drawing with colors, again, are likely to, depending on the age, might be watercolors or pastels, sometimes referred to as crayons, which present their own issues of preserving the, the vibrancy of the colors. And then graphite and pa pastels are considered friable material, which means that they're easily smudged or rubbed from their support. So how you store them becomes an issue. Uh, again, you'll encounter these in older drawings and those that are created more recently in the last several decades are likely to be the result of more stable processes. But it's also important for these older drawings to know whether you are dealing with the original or a reproduction. As again, as I'm sort of emphasizing here, the production method posed different challenges. Regarding original drawings prior to 1860, you'll likely find mostly ink or possibly pencil or graphite on paper. The type of the paper may vary from high quality rag to cheaper acidic construction paper. Between the 1860s through the 1960s, you are likely to encounter ink on linen, often referred to as drafting cloth, which is great if you have that because the linen is really good for rolled storage as it will typically lay flat once you unroll it, unlike other types of materials. Uh, starting in the 1920s through the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, we see the use of coated or plasticized paper, sometimes referred to as vellum. It's semi-transparent or translucent, and it is different from the animal hide vellum, which we think of as being used for like medieval manuscripts. The oils and resins in earlier vellum can degrade, causing the paper to become brittle and discolored. Later from the 1950s on, the vellum is, was generally created using polymers that are typically more stable. And then drafting film is another term that, that is used. It's more transparent than vellum. Uh, earlier versions were cellulose acetate film, which can off gas. But beginning in the 1960s, polyester really became more common. It's sometimes referred to as mylar, and this tends to be more stable under proper storage conditions. And then computer-aided design dates back as early as the 1960s. I actually used it in a drafting class in the 1980s, uh, but it really became more prevalent starting in the 1990s. And today, I think it's fair to say this is the default way for creating original drawings. And I'll discuss electronic media later but just know that these typically entail proprietary file formats and other uh, considerations typical of electronic records. But you're likely not going to have the original drawing. As the term implies, there generally is only one copy. Most likely you will be dealing with reproductions since these are derivative copies distributed and used in the actual planning or construction of a specific project. And these four here are what I consider the most common types you're likely to encounter, but just know that over the decades there have been others. Um, overall, reproductions prior to computer-generated copies 
are typically light sensitive and can off gas due to the chemical processes used to create them. And when I talk about off gassing, it's not like you're going to be overcome by fumes, but just know that that chemical process continues and will have an effect on the materials and anything that is stored around them. Blueprints are probably the most well-known reproduction format, so much so that that term has become shorthand for all construction drawings. And while they date as far back as the 1700s, the process was really perfected in the 19th century and then mechanized in the early 20th century. Blueprints represent one of the most successful reproduction processes. It uses uh, or used light sensitive chemical compounds, which were then washed in a wet process, creating the blue background and white lines that is hopefully familiar to everyone. Conservation issues include the quality of paper and whether or not the chemical residue remains due to an inadequate washing process. But because they were created through a wet process, they can withstand water damage better than other materials. Uh, not that you should get them wet, but just keep that in mind. They're a little bit more sturdy. They are sensitive to alkaline materials, so you do not want to house them in any buffered folders or other containers because the buffer is an alkaline compound. Van Dykes, also known as brown prints, are another form of producing copies. And these were predominantly used from 1900 to 1960. It is another light sensitive wet chemical process, in this case creating either dark brown lines on a white background, which is a positive image, or white lines on a brown background which is a negative image. And so these are subject to accelerated deterioration due to residual nitrates. And again, are light sensitive. Sepia is a more modern brown tone version, common from the 1960s through the 1990s. Uh, they were created through a dry Diazo-like process. Uh, they were sometimes coated with oils or resins, which, and they can also deteriorate rapidly when exposed to UV light, and particularly with the oils and resins, it can get really messy. Um, my big nemesis is the Diazo, or the blue line process. It was first a wet process back in the 19th century, but a dry process was developed in around 1920, which was continued in use through the end of the 20th century. And this is where paper was infused with, again, chemicals and exposed to UV light to create the image, which is typically a dark line on a light background, and hence the term blue line. And diazos were more cost effective than blueprints, and they served as a really inexpensive distribution copy. As a result, they can be the most common format you encounter. Unfortunately, it is also one of the least stable formats. The paper is usually of poor quality and the residual chemicals remain embedded in the paper. This means that continued exposure to air and light will discolor and fade the image. It won't happen overnight, but over the years, you will have a problem. So reformatting is really the only preservation solution for diazos. And a quick word about early electrostatic toner or pen plotters, which used felt tip ink pens. Uh, these were common, again, from the 60s through the 1990s. Uh, depending on the process and the ink used, you might have issues with images and color fading. But as I've said a, a few times, I think now the technology these days to print copies from born digital files is much better, so we do see less preservation issues with current large format printers and plotters. Just to give a visual representation of some of what I've just been talking about, um, the upper left image is your typical blueprint, dark blue background, white lines. The lower left image is graphite on vellum. It's kind of hard to represent the translucent nature of the paper, but that's what it is. Uh, the center image is the Diazo. Uh, this exhibits the typical discoloration of the paper which can manifest itself in this yellowing way or in other more, I've seen it in more purplish or blotchy patterns. It really kind of depends on 
how far along uh, the process is. And on the right is a negative Van Dyke. It's negative because the background is dark and the lines of the drawing are light. A positive image would just be the opposite with a light background and dark brown lines similar to the Diazo image. And I'm just going to put in the chat, the University of Illinois um, has a great preservation format identification guide, including a section on architectural drawings uh, that goes into a lot more detail and there's a lot of other uh, published resources out there if, if you want to dig deeper into these issues. But plans are, I think it's fair to say, born digital these days. Typically they're generated using uh, proprietary software resulting in files that are in some proprietary format. The two most common types of software-based design programs are computer-aided design or CAD and building information modeling or BIM. Um, AutoCAD, and this is not a commercial, is one of the more common software products you're likely to encounter. And without getting bogged down in the technical weeds of these technologies, let me just say that because these are proprietary systems that produce proprietary file formats, long-term access and preservation is more complex. I worked at one place where we had a slew of AutoCAD files, but we didn't have the AutoCAD software to actually access them. It's a bit of a problem. Also, this software it has an interactive or 3D aspect you know, that enables engineers or architects or even uh, facilities folks to interact with the files and do their jobs. But this poses some significant digital preservation challenges because we don't have a stable file format for that yet. Um, so you might need to conduct some form of needs assessment or business analysis to determine whether you need to maintain the original interactive format or whether a more stable format will meet your needs, such as TIFF or PDFA. These can preserve the information without the interactive aspects of the native file formats. And if you decide to scan paper versions or to convert the proprietary native files, you do want to consider uncompressed TIFF and PDFA, these are the two standard preservation formats for electronic records. Uh, PDFE, as in engineering, is the standard for a uh, PDF standard for engineering drawings that does support a 3D functionality. However, it has not been widely adopted and it seems like it will be phased out and a future version of PDFA, PDFA4, will incorporate support for this functionality. Uh, the standard is, from what I understand, still under development. I think it was anticipated for publication in October 2020, but here we are today, uh, and we're still waiting. Quick word about geographic information systems, and I almost hesitate to raise them because they're kind of a whole different animal. They are another complicated application where spatial, geographic, and other data sets are related to an interactive map layer, and they pose, again, a variety of records management and preservation challenges because both map layers and data sets can be routinely updated, and these systems are based on proprietary software. Uh, this really could be and probably should be a whole other topic, but I wanted to at least acknowledge these systems though in some respects they are an outlier on what we're focused on today. So while the ideal is to manage born digital records electronically throughout their life cycle, these computer design and mapping files are more complex when it comes to long-term retention and access. Which brings me to the second half where I wanna talk about some basic records management but through the lens of maps, plans, and drawings, and this notion of oversized materials. And I'm starting on the assumption that perhaps your records house is not in order. And you might have a wall of drawings and don't know where to start. And if you don't know where to start, um, 
I think it's fair to say a needs assessment is an important building block when embarking on any project to improve records management and overall efficiency of access and use, and that's no different for maps and drawings. It's useful to start by identifying the challenges and opportunities related to their storage, organization, and condition, as well as any access needs in terms of retrieval and frequency of use. Understanding how your organization creates and uses these records, as well as any public demands or expectations for access, is important to help reach sustainable and appropriate solutions. For example, building planning and zoning functions may overlap or can overlap. If different departments or staff are responsible for these functions, you may need to examine your overall workflow to ensure you're not unnecessarily retaining duplicate sets of plans. Or if you have a large quantity of older maps in poor condition, you may need to consider a conservation project before attempting to reformat materials. I often see folks start with a solution and work backwards to fit a perceived problem rather than the other way around. And a needs assessment kind of gets you off on a, a good first step. It can be overwhelming as getting intellectual and physical control over these types of records can be labor intensive. So depending on the size of your organization, you may want to focus on a single department or a subset of plans or drawings. Just remember whatever situation you're facing likely didn't happen overnight. So any solution will likely not be instantaneous. Based on your assessment, you can then devise possible solutions and consulting the state archives. I, I'm biased obviously, but I think we're a, a great resource to help you through this process. So to explore your options, you don't have to do it on your own. One possible option, which tends to be popular, is reformatting, either to support active business needs or public access to historical records. But your assessment might reveal other possibilities or needs in terms of storage and access. Simply layering technology on top of your records program may not solve problems and may have unintended consequences. Sorry, I went too fast. Uh, so let's talk about reformatting for a second. There may be good reasons to do this, such as lack of adequate storage for physical hard copies or to facilitate access. Reformatting is also a good option to help preserve information and reduce wear and tear. In both cases for microfilm and digitization, you will want to or need to conduct image verification in line with our guidelines before disposing of any hard copy versions. This helps ensure that everything was scanned properly, each image is legible and usable, and is linked correctly to any indexing terms. Now microfilm gets a bad rap for being obsolete, and I get it. There are challenges with microfilm, including image quality and particularly maintaining scale with these oversized materials. Access is fairly manual, requires a film reader. Making copies, again, is much more challenging when we're talking about a three by four foot map or plan. And if you have map legends or other, you know, color keyed uh, information, color microfilm can be expensive. But before you dismiss it completely, it is an incredibly stable format that is good for long-term preservation. So if long-term preservation is the goal, keep this option in mind. It is really a good backup solution. More likely, however, since we are in the 21st century, most people will consider digitization when they consider reformatting. Strictly speaking, preservation scanning is not an accurate term since digital files in and of themselves are not permanent. It is an excellent option, though, to enhance access. But we need to consider a whole host of variables, including the following. I've already touched on file format, but to recap, you want to scan either as uncompressed TIFF or PDFA in line with the State Archives imaging guidelines. For image resolution, we refer to pixels per inch. And strictly speaking, PPI is a result or an output. It is not simply a scanner setting. So you want to ensure that any scanner is properly calibrated and tested. Um, 
generally 300 ppi will be adequate however a higher resolution for example 600 ppi may be needed to properly capture smaller details especially for complex images or older drawings so you might need to do some test scans to determine the appropriate level of resolution required keep in mind the higher the resolution the larger the resulting file will be even at 300 ppi scan maps and drawings are likely to be relatively large files so if you're scanning a lot of maps and plans you will require significant storage space either on your servers or a cloud storage provider and this represents a long-term cost so factoring in digital storage and preservation into your information technology practices is important just scanning records does not solve your records management challenges you then need to develop a system to manage those digital files and one option is an electronic content management system and there are a bunch of acronyms electronic document records management system a digital asset management system whatever you want to call it um, these can facilitate access retrieval and use often these systems can be accessed from a variety of devices such as tablets which is great it allows staff to go out into the field and still use the materials and of course digital files can be made publicly available via the internet which reduces public demands on staff time but whether you incorporate digital files in one of these types of systems or you simply store them in network folders and I've seen that approach done well I've seen it done not so well um, so whether you're using uh, an electronic uh, records management system or just storing them on your network the use of sufficient metadata or index terms is particularly important for continued uh, use and access of these digital files and this can represent a significant effort to capture since unlike text heavy materials uh, optical character recognition OCR may not always be sufficient and I would argue will not be sufficient to capture the necessary level of detail and I'll discuss indexing more towards the end when I talk about access as with all electronic records there are complex preservation issues even if you reformat to TIFF and PDFA uh, in cases of permanent or long-term retention we are faced with hardware and software obsolescence and the need to migrate to newer platforms and storage solutions so ensuring that your IT practices take these variables into account is important it's not just about multiple backups uh, backups need to be part of a larger IT framework since in isolation they only do so much but let me get back to some records management basics um, an inventory it's sort of the foundation of a solid records management program since an inventory or a survey will allow you to get intellectual control over your records to know what you have and where they're located we have all other workshop on this so I won't go into many details but surveying the location where active and inactive plans or maps are used and stored will help you understand the formats volume and condition of your records and it can be part of that needs assessment or be sort of the next step after you've done your initial needs assessment to capture that level of information so for example are most of your drawings original graphic designs if so good for you but are they reproductions and if so what process was used to create them do you mostly have Diazo copies so the inventory or survey can help guide you further towards uh, appropriate answers and solutions while also serving as a basic tool to enhance access through recording some basic metadata about location and retention information in terms of retention and disposition I see this as no different from other records it is important to remember that not all maps plans and drawings have the same retention period if you're a state agency consult your agency specific schedules for local governments these are most commonly found in series related to building permits zoning functions capital construction projects and transportation infrastructure 
in the, some series are scheduled as permanent. Many series in general, emphasis on in general, have a minimum retention period of six years after life of structure. This is often interpreted in practice as being permanent because of the lifespan of these structures. They're certainly longer than my lifespan, as well as the importance these records have to a community. So long-term retention necessarily impacts and complicates storage solutions and preservation needs. Also about retention is version control, which includes drafts or superseded plans. And this is where the labor intensive aspect of these materials can really come into play, particularly if you have not actively managed these records for a while. Unlike other series of records, uh, this can become an item level task, but it is important to identify versions of the same plans. So you'll want to check the dates, signatures, seals, and other identification markings to determine what the most current version might be. Not actively managing versions comes with risks, especially given the typical volume of these records and how fast versions or copies can multiply. And in this case, I think of the infamous trouble with tribbles from Star Trek. Generally speaking, you likely only need to retain the as-built, those drawings that represent the structure as constructed, or you may need to only retain the version that was officially acted upon, such as the version approved by a zoning board. Your business needs will dictate how long you should retain any superseded drawings, but generally these should not be retained permanently. One place I worked, I thought we needed to invest significantly in additional storage, but it turned out that two thirds of the drawings were duplicates or obsolete. So simply by slogging through the volume of records that had accumulated over decades, I was able to save money and improve efficiency. It took time and dedicated effort, um, but I like to think the results paid off in the end. So let's talk about physical storage. This will depend on your environment and available space, obviously, so your mileage will vary. Uh, folded storage is not recommended. Over time, the folds will become weak spots in the structure of the paper, and tears and loss of information will develop. And I understand there is a desire to keep the oversized drawings together with their associated textual records, like I you know, mentioned at the beginning of this session. So they're often crammed into folders and boxes, and I understand that logic, but if you can avoid it, it can and should be avoided. I've never really seen it done well or effectively. Um, flat storage is always preferred, but requires a larger footprint, and frankly, is not always possible. Flat file cabinets are also expensive. Uh, I would recommend dedicating any available flat storage to your most historically valuable or fragile oversized materials. And if you have rolled materials that you want to store flat, there are strategies to flatten them that aren't that complicated for the most part. Uh, so consult us if you're in that situation. Storing plans and maps rolled, however, can save space and is a good compromise between flat and folded. Uh, rolled materials will experience some stress over time, but not to the same degree as folded items. Uh, you also want to make sure that materials are properly housed. So if, it's, if you're storing them flat, that it's, we're talking about oversized folders, which can facilitate access and retrieval, as well as provide some basic protection. And if you're rolling them, we're talking about tubes or rectangular boxes, which are sometimes referred to as square tubes. I know an oxymoron, but that's the term. Uh, for rolled storage, depending on the fragility or condition of the materials, you may want to first roll it around a tube uh, and then store it in an individual box, as this will reduce the pressure on the materials and provide some extra support. Keep in mind the tighter the roll, the more stress will be placed on the materials, and over time, this will have an effect. Now, you may want to have one structure or project per folder or tube, or for property records, you might be thinking along the lines of section, block, and lot. With the larger projects or developments, or even over time, if a particular property 
has a lot of construction going on, you may need multiple folders or tubes. So you may have a separate one for the type of drawing, for example, one for floor plans and another for mechanical drawings. And, and again, that will really be based on what is your access needs. Uh, regardless of the approach you choose, and you may opt for a mixed approach of some flat and some rolled storage, you will want to clearly label the folders or tubes to identify the contents sufficiently that anyone will know what is inside them without opening them. Anything you can do to limit handling of the materials is important. And again, I'll touch on access and use at the end. Regarding maps, uh, map books and bound folios, just like any bound volume, storing flat is ideal, though you will want to limit how high you stack them because you don't want the total weight to negatively affect the volume on the bottom. You can house these in archival boxes, such as clamshell boxes, which provide an extra layer of protection. But unless they fit perfectly, you may wind up wasting valuable shelf space. And custom-made boxes, while an option, can be costly. Another option would be to wrap them in archivally sound paper or some sort of four-fold uh, enclosure uh, to provide a minimum level of extra protection so they're just not sitting out exposed on shelves. But uh, that last option is really if you're not going to access them very often. And with any storage, proper environmental controls are important since fluctuations in temperature and humidity will take their toll over time. So as as best as you can. I know a lot of us don't, as government employees, we don't work in the most environmentally sound uh, or controlled climates, but do the best you can. And here are some examples of best practices. On the left are your typical flat files. Again, they require a large footprint, including space to open the drawers and retrieve materials. I know some places have used short stacks uh, and then use the top of the cabinets as a work table or a work area to spread drawings out. Uh, with that approach, you lose vertical storage, but you gain a work area. Uh, and in the center, we have a great example of rolled storage. Uh, the ends of the boxes are clearly labeled. Uh, they fit on standard steel shelving. Uh, it's a great space saver approach. And on the right is a map tower. Uh, this is a good option for smaller volume of records or smaller size materials. And again, allows um, a, both a mix of rolled and flat storage. Two examples I would just urge you to avoid, but I have found somewhat common. On the left is hanging storage, which it saves space, but over time the weight of the drawing will gradually weaken on the side that is clamped. So it will lead to tearing. And on the right is an example of honeycomb storage. These are typically made from materials which are not archivally sound, such as wood or some composite material. They don't facilitate access and retrieval. It is difficult to label the plans, and you have to roll them tight enough to fit in the tubes. And vertical honeycomb storage like this will gradually weaken the bottom edge of the records. So the weight of the drawing will crush that bottom edge over time, leading to potential loss of information. So access and use. I've actually kind of talked quite a bit about this, so I won't go into too many details because uh, I'd love to get to questions. But if they're flat, keep them as flat as possible. Support them as much as possible if you need to transport them. Be mindful of doorways, narrow hallways, or stairs. Again, I worked in one place where our flat files couldn't actually fit through the door flat, um, and it was always a little bit of a juggling. These are unwieldy in size, and they can be in delicate condition. It's always best to slide materials side to side or pull out folders from flat file drawers completely to get to the stuff at the bottom rather than flipping back materials. And I know, flipping back, whether it's folders or drawings, happens frequently. It is time consuming to do it a different way. But even though I'm guilty of it, I'm here today to urge you to resist that temptation. Know the best practices. 
so that you can at least adapt and do the best you can within the limitations of your environment. Now, whether it's hard copy or electronic, and hopefully the, the benefits of having an electronic system are, are self-evident in terms of decreasing wear and tear and increasing access, but whether it's hard copy or electronic, you do need to, to develop that indexing information, that metadata. And whether it's in a, an electronic document management system or simply a spreadsheet or an access database, uh, it is important to record that identifying information. And the level of detail will depend on your particular circumstances and business needs. Before you index or catalog your drawings, you'll want to think about how staff or the public use and access them. What are their needs and how can you make retrieval as efficient as possible? There's nothing worse than having to re-engineer an um, indexing scheme because you, you realize there's a need that wasn't accounted for. And index fields can include a variety of, of values, including the project title, any also known as designation, since some projects might be known by different names, the location of the project, so an address or an SBL number, the date or date range, maybe even the types of drawings. Again, I worked at one place where knowing where the electrical drawings and the fire suppressant drawings were important. So identifying whether it's a floor plan or a plumbing or a mechanical plan might, might be necessary. The number of sheets in a set of drawings might be important. We're supposed to have 49, but we only have 46. We're missing three. Uh, and any other sort of control or identifying values if there are drawing numbers. Um, and of course, the storage location, so you, if it's physical hard copy, so you know where to get it. And if um, retention is less than permanent, you would also want to record that as well. Um, so I have some final thoughts uh, that I want to leave you with, and it's just based on my years of dealing with these types of records. If your records house is in order, congratulations. I would love to hear some success stories. But mostly what I've encountered is an array of challenges. First, keep in mind, oversized maps, plans, and drawings come with unique characteristics that we need to understand and account for. However, the fundamentals of good records management, that inventory, inactive storage practices, retention and disposition, again, these basic best practices, these are at the heart of it all. And taking the position that there isn't time or staff to get your records house in order won't solve any problems. Good records management will reduce costs while improving efficiency and productivity. And while records management does cost administrative dollars and staff time, whether paper or electronic, records don't manage themselves. So ignoring issues or simply accepting the status quo won't lead to any meaningful improvements. And I think in the long run, the time spent working around an inefficient system could be better used to tackle some of these issues head on. And it may be overwhelming and you don't have to do it all at once. I always like to urge people to take small steps in the right direction than to do nothing at all. And you're not alone. Contact us at the State Archives. We can't do it for you, but we can support your efforts. We are here to help. And you know our services are free. So don't be shy. Reach out and let us know what you're up against, and we can figure out a way to help you. And with that, um, Oh, I'm a little bit ahead of where I thought I was, but still plenty of time for uh, questions. And we do have some questions here, Dennis. Uh, first of all, we've got a, uh, Felicia. She says here, Dennis, you have seen our maps here in the town of Poughkeepsie, hence why I have a few from oh, yes. the town <laughs> picking this preservation uh, position for tips. Hope this helps us all, she says. More of a comment, I believe. Yes, just just by hoping, without sharing any secrets of the town of Poughkeepsie, they are one of the examples that uh, it, it's a challenge. It's and it's a volume challenge. It's not even that it's 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 a preservation issue. You just have a lot, and uh, in that case, it's kind of whittling away, figuring out where to start. Um, yeah. 
Okay, we have a question here from Rob. He says, I may have missed it, but for flat storage, how high can you go? Um, in terms of if, if it's about um, the map books, uh, generally speaking, you don't want to go, I, I would say, probably more than a, a foot or so. It will really depend on the size of the books and the thickness of the volumes, because in, in that case, it's... Um, it's a weight issue. Um, if you're talking about like rolled storage um, vertical and taking advantage of, of that kind of vertical storage, I'd say as high as your ceiling goes. Um, and then with flat file storage, the big issue, depending on how high you stack those drawers, is um, at a certain point getting flat files um, folders out of those drawers is just going to be physically challenging. So if you're on your own, um, it's going to be a little bit unwieldy. And I, again, I've worked in places where I've had to go and use a step stool to get to the top flat file drawer. And it's possible, um, but know that there are trade-offs. So, and, and that's, I think, the, when I think of records management and archives, the, the golden rule or that fine line of what is the trade-off, what is the benefit versus what is the cost, and that's where we find um, what is the acceptable solution. So hopefully that answers. Okay, um, Megan uh, says here, uh, if we have plans both in PDF and hard copy, we usually keep the hard copy to use during construction and inspections. After the permit is closed, we get rid of the paper copy and keep only the electronic version. Is this okay? Yes. Actually, that makes really good sense. Um, one of the questions we get, I think, frequently is the question of if we have the hard copy or if we have an electronic version, do we have to keep the hard copy? Let me just say it is a seemingly simple question with really complex answers. So reach out to us. Um, to have that discussion, but in short, there is no requirement. You just need to make sure that the electronic version is accessible for the length of its retention period, which if we're talking about permanent, is a really long time. So making sure that those PDFs are actually PDFAs and not some other version of PDF would be important. And then that also goes into what are your IT practices so that you can ensure that you have access to those PDFs. Uh, I've been in, again, prior to the, coming to the State Archives, in, in a place where we were scanning everything PDFA. We were doing you know, best practices, and then we needed to migrate to a new system, and we realized several hundred of our PDFAs had become corrupted. Now, I'm not a technologist, so I can't tell you why or how. It just happened. Uh, and so we were kind of, luckily we had not disposed of the paper and we could go back and scan those. And it was a small percentage of the tens of thousands that we had scanned. But just know that digital records are not um, in and of themselves uh, carefree. Okay, uh, we have a question here from James. Are there any grants available to help facilitate some of these issues? If you are a local government in New York State, we do have the Local Government uh, Records Improvement Management Fund, LGRIMF, uh, which we hope to um, offer next, early next year. So yes is the short answer. There are a number of different projects uh, that would uh, address these types of issues. If you're a local government, reach out to your regional advisor um, so they can help you sort of scope out what is a, a reasonable project. So and when we're able to announce the next round of grants, again, hopefully next year, um, you'll be ready to go. Okay. Um, Matt asks, do you have any recommendations for content management slash electronic document management systems? I am working with real property at our county to find a product uh, or vendor to provide a way to house some of our most important maps. Yeah, um, because this is being recorded and put out to the public, I, I am reluctant to name any specific vendors uh, because we can't, um, 
be seen as being partial or preferential. But if you contact, uh, if you're a local government, uh, contact your RAO, and we can certainly tell you what other local governments are using and point you in those directions. And I do want to add, I did paste in the URL to uh, contact our RAOs, but the, probably the best thing to do is Google the New York State Archives, scroll down to the bottom of the page where it says contact us, click on that, and then you'll find the regional advisory officers listed by county. So it's really the best thing. Just Google us. Not to put a plug in for Google, but it's probably the easiest uh, thing to do. So a uh, question here from Lori. So I have always been told that maps have a permanent retention. So if we scan them, we can destroy them. But you kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Yeah, they're, they're not necessarily permanent, but by default they are often considered permanent. And then scanning and destroying, uh, the short answer is yes, while permissible, there are a lot of variables to consider. And uh, Palma asks, how would I go about getting uh, a needs assessment? Does the archives do this, or are there uh, companies out there that do this? Uh, so there's two answers. Uh, your RAO can certainly help you through the process. Um, I hate to speak for my REO colleagues and say, yeah, we'll come out and actually do it, particularly during these um, sort of uncertain times. Our ability to show up in person is is limited. Uh, but there are records management consultants. Again, um, your REO can, can give you sort of the list of usual suspects of who might be able to help you with that. And Robert asks, do you have any suggestions for imaging already damaged maps? It depends on how damaged they are. If you're talking about, you know, a few tears along the edges, uh, there are, you know, keep keep in mind when, generally speaking, when you're going to scan oversized materials, you're going to feed it through an oversized scanner. So it's going through mechanical rollers of some sort. So depending on the fragility of the materials, you may not be able to do that. Um, you may, if it's just a few small tears, there are ways of of encapsulating it in like a, a mylar enclosure that, so you don't actually have to go to the expense or the length of formal conservation. If it's really damaged, um, you may need to uh, hire a conservator um, and invest in that kind of expense. So again, it depends on the level of damage and how fragile they are and, you know, how valuable, I would also say, you know, are they really historically valuable that going to that level of investment is cost effective or makes sense? And uh, Wendy asks, what is the approximate cost of the cardboard boxes for rolled maps and where can I purchase them? Okay, I know I said I can't um, or should not sort of seem partial to vendors, but I'm putting in a URL to Uline, which has, um, they're called just tall boxes, but I, I also urge you to price comparison shop other sources just so that I can be impartial. Okay, and um... Felicia uh, asks, what's the difference between a PDF versus a PDF-A? Um, it is, um, it, it basically is, without getting into the technical details, but there are different versions of PDF that have different technical specifications, and PDF-A is the designation for what is considered archivally sound, which, it, it, in short, it has certain security features to ensure the integrity and uh, stability of that file, including, for example, it embeds the fonts in the file. So normal PDF documents will take whatever font files your operating system has and translate whatever the font is in the file to whatever your system has access to whereas PDFA actually embeds that native font. So it creates an, 
uh, an exact replication of what that document looked like. So it's just the short layman's version is it's the archival standard and again the, the technical um, aspects of of it are there to ensure the that the integrity and the accessibility of the file is there. And also just going back to the scanning of fragile maps, the uh, one option that I didn't mention is that if you're using a vendor they may have overhead camera arrays to scan those types of materials. Again, that's going to be a, a cost benefit analysis to sort of undertake as to whether the materials require that level of, of uh, treatment. Okay, we have a question from Christine. Um, I believe that we have a very good set of building plans, roll, label, et cetera. Then we have piles of drawings that I have no idea what they are for. Who can I ask for help to uh, ask to help us sort this all out? Um, I again, w without throwing my RAOs under the bus, uh, you can start with us to sort of get a sense of what the scale and scope is. Um, again, we can't necessarily do it for you. Uh, for myself, I'm one person for 11 counties, but we can at least. Uh, triage and assess what your options are. It might be a matter of, again, hiring a consultant or getting a, an intern or something like that to help. Because that, yeah, those piles and those rolls of, of mystery drawings, that's where the labor uh, intensive uh, aspect of these projects really come into play of how do you get a handle on it when you don't know what it is. And it really comes down to unrolling it, figuring it out slogging through it. Okay, we have a question from uh, Amy. Uh, how about tips from going from rolled to flat storage? Rolled to flat storage? Yeah, it can be done. Um, I, I hesitate to say too much about it because there are some you want to be careful depending on the age of the materials. In, in brief, it's just a, a matter of humidification. And I know we normally say, oh, humidity is not good for materials. We don't like it. But if you have like older maps or rolled materials that are like stiff uh, and you're afraid of, you know, you try to unroll it, it's going to crack. That's where a very uh, simple humidification process uh, can allow the paper fibers to absorb some moisture and relax, and then it will flatten in and of itself. Uh, if it's not that kind of tight roll and it's just kind of rolled loosely and you can flatten it, just putting like weights on it so that over time the, the paper will flatten in and of itself, definitely that's something to talk with us about how to start that or do that because you don't want to um, do it in such a way that causes damage to the materials, whether it's because the materials are too stiff and rolled too tightly, or again, if you're talking about humidification, that naturally means you're talking about water and you don't want to have an unforeseen accident, uh, particularly if certain, certain of the materials that older drawings are made of might not be, might be water soluble. And so you, you just want to be somewhat careful about that, but there are simple ways of, of doing that. Okay, and I uh, see Rob just asked the same question. He probably uh, typed it in before, uh, before he had a chance to, to hear uh, that that was coming from Amy as well. Okay, Felicia has a question. She says, I'm in the process of scanning in all of our building permits dating back to the 1920s. Once they are scanned, uh, again, it's another question about can I destroy them? Yeah, and, and again, the, the short answer is yes. The long answer is you, hopefully your information technology infrastructure and your government's commitment to ensuring ongoing access to those digital files. It's, you know, hopefully you've had those conversations and if you haven't, now's the time to have them and if bringing in the state archives would help, um, again, reach out to us. Okay, and uh, we got a question here 
uh, from Mary Ellen. Uh, we have a very organized archive room, and most of the plans are in boxes labeled on the outside of each box. What's the best way to digital, digitally record where everything is? She's asking maybe like a Excel spreadsheet yeah. or something else you recommend. Yeah, de depending on the volume, if if you, I mean, congratulations for for seemingly having a, a really good system in place. Uh, yeah, I, I've used just simple spreadsheets. It, again, depending on the volume of, you know, if if it's a small inactive storage space or a huge storage space, you, you might want to develop an access database or something. But a simple spreadsheet that records uh, sort of that indexing information I talked about with the location would 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 be sufficient. You don't have to go too too crazy about it or too complex. But again, it will depend on your needs and really how complex or how how many drawings you really have. Okay. Um, oh, here's actually this is I think we have time for one more question here. This is from Kathy. It's kind of an opposite of the other previous questions about rolled rolled maps. She said, I have old maps that have been folded to fit in the file drawers and stored that way for years. Should I unfold them and move them to rolled tubes for storage now? Uh, that would be the best option if you're if you're able to. Um, yes, there's there's nothing worse than folds for for paper. Uh, again, that over time that will turn into a tear. Um, and if you have space for rolled storage, yes, the complicating factor or the trade-off on that is if you're taking them out of associated files, if it's a construction project or a building property file, um, you then need to record, okay, I have the rolled storage over here on the left, but then I have the associated records in this filing cabinet, and how do you accomplish that? And again, that's where a simple spreadsheet can can solve that challenge. But um, if you have the ability and you have the space to go to rolled storage, that's always, um, in my mind, preferable to fold it. But I will concede, having been to a variety of local governments, I concede, concede the point that sometimes fold storage is what you can do. So. Well, and that uh, concludes really our questions for today. It's uh, our time for today. Um, I just want to point out that I did also put in again the uh, link to our website if you have any questions, and I did uh, also again. Uh, just put our uh, URL in for our, uh, for our advisory, regional advisory officers. If you are a local government in New York State, feel free to go to that link um, and find your regional advisory officer for your county. And um, that's what uh, we're here for, to help you out. Or if uh, worst case scenario, you could always uh, email us at uh, arctrain uh, at nised.gov. Uh, which is the same email that uh, you got in the instructions for this uh, webinar. And so uh, any final words, Dennis, before we say goodbye? No, just thanks for everyone showing up. Thank you, Rich, and uh, until we meet again. Thanks very much, everybody.